your Bibles. If you don't have one, we've got one for you. You're going to need it this morning. We are in Acts chapter 1 because we are starting a brand new study this morning. We just finished David last week. It was wonderful study. And so many of you had some great suggestions about where we should be going next. <laughs> Boy, I get them. Man, but the good thing is you guys love the Bible. You had a lot of good suggestions throughout the whole thing. Uh, but it came down to this. We we're either going to do Romans or the book of Acts. Now, Romans would have been more theological, more doctrinal in nature, a little bit heavier. It's like if you've gone through one of the Gospels, the book of Romans, the book of Revelation, you kind of have the whole picture. Now, a lot of you guys from Wednesday morning reminded me of that. We're in the book of Romans for our men's group. They said, oh, pastor, we got to do this on Sunday morning. This would be so good. So you're lobbying for that. It was a contender, but <laughs> with the book of Acts, you get a whole different perspective. You'd not call the book of Acts doctrinal or theological. In fact, there are many that would say that it would have been impossible to tell what the early church believed theologically if the only record you had was the book of Acts. And that's true, because the book of Acts is not the record of what the early church believed. It's the record of what the early church did. And what the early church did was to spread the gospel. It would not be unfair to say that the whole message of the book of Acts can be summed up with this one verse from Acts chapter 1. Jesus said, and you shall be my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what the book of Acts is all about. It starts with the disciples spreading the gospel in Jerusalem. By the middle of chapter 9, if you flip through the Bible and book of Acts, you might see that. In the middle of chapter 9, the author can speak of the church that's throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Now what's important in this statement is not only has the church been expanding, but now the message of the gospel has started to move out to those who are not fully Jews. It will not be long until the apostles are convinced that the gospel is for everyone. Jew and Gentile alike. And of course, that's where the Apostle Paul comes into the picture. He's the man that God raises up to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews of the Roman world. So by Acts chapter 20, we find that the gospel of Jesus Christ has spread throughout all Asia Minor, Greece, and most of the Eastern Mediterranean world. In this, the goal and calling of Paul has been fulfilled. The gospel has been preached throughout the whole Roman Empire. So much so that in Acts 17, you have the disciple described as the men who turned the world, what? Upside down for Jesus Christ. And really what they did, they turned the world right side up. But that still leaves a quarter of the book of Acts to go. From chapter 20 on, what you have is the account of how the Apostle Paul took the gospel of Jesus Christ to the very heart of the then known world. And that, of course, is Rome itself. The point being that the gospel is not only preached throughout the then known world, but it was preached in the highest courts to the most powerful people in the Roman world. And everywhere the gospel went, people believed. And every place that believed, churches were started even in Rome. You see, the disciples did exactly what Jesus asked them to do. They became his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They went into all the world and they made disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you how effective they were in this endeavor. They got the gospel of Jesus Christ all the way to us. Isn't that amazing? A little group in Jerusalem started out. The gospel gets all the way to a little island in the middle of the Pacific. 
Folks, that's awesome. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. Now, that's not to say there's not some good theology in the book of Acts. There is, and we're going to see a lot of it. In fact, we're going to learn a lot about salvation and the doctrine of salvation. And what we're going to find out is that the benefits of salvation can be summed up with two things. Forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can learn a lot about the forgiveness of sin in other books in the New Testament, particularly the book of Romans, 1 John. But if you want to learn about the Holy Spirit, you have come to the right book. There are many say that the book of Acts would be better titled The Acts of the Holy Spirit. In this book, we're going to see some powerful demonstrations of how the Holy Spirit is to function in our lives. And let me say this right from the beginning. Everything the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts through the disciples, he wants to do through us now. D did you get that? Everything the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts through the disciples, he wants to do in us right now. In fact, I think I could go so far as to say that what the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts sets the stage for what the Holy Spirit wants to do through us right now. Listen to Joel's description of how the Holy Spirit would function in the last days. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What Joel is saying here is that we should be anticipating a powerful move of the Holy Spirit in the last days. So if we're in the last days, and I believe that we are, then guess who this radical move of the Spirit is going to come through? Yeah, us. We are the sons and daughters that will prophesy. We are the old men, the young men who will see visions and, see, and dream dreams. We are the maid servants and the men servants that God is going to pour his spirit out upon. Some of the awesome wonders that God is going to do on the earth, he's going to do through you. And, and I'll tell you this. One of the things that you are going to be challenged with as we go through the book of Acts is your personal relationship with the Holy Spirit and the gifts that he has given you. M my prayer for you, and I, folks, I was, I was praying this over our church this morning, is that you will long for the power of God's Spirit working in you, that you will see a need for the Holy Spirit in your life in a fresh in a new way, because one of the things I'm totally convinced of is that the Holy Spirit wants to keep working in new and fresh ways in our lives. What the Holy Spirit did in us yesterday and through us yesterday, folks, that was for yesterday. And he's got a new work that he wants to do in us today. And I believe that in many ways, God is going to show us what that whole new thing is going to look like as we go through the book of Acts. There's a fresh new move of the Spirit that God wants for each and every one of us to be walking in. There's a fresh move of the Spirit that God wants our church to be walking in. And that revelation is going to come as we go through this book. And it's going to be exciting. You know, I, I hope you realize that God has given each and every one of you a spiritual gift. I mean, you, you know that, don't you? Don't you know that? It's not just the pastors and the elders and the leaders that have spiritual gifts. No, we all have spiritual gifts. Listen to what Paul says about this in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. 
But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to who? Each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing them to each one individually as he wills. The Spirit is given to each one, and that each one includes you. He's given you spiritual gifts, and think about these gifts. There's the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge that allows us to speak into each other's lives. There's faith to believe God for huge and amazing things. There's gifts of healing. There's working of miracles. There's the discerning of spirits so we know what's from God and what's from the enemy. There's the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Folks, those are wild things. They are. And all of you, all of you have at least one of them. I hope you're going to discover or perhaps rediscover the spiritual gifts that God has placed in you and then start using those spiritual gifts in our church. Now, another neat aspect of the book of Acts is that it gives us 10 evangelistic sermons. Did you know that? In this, we get 10 great models of how the gospel can be presented in different situations. We're going to see the gospel presented to the Jews and to the Gentiles, to the cultured and the uncultured. We're going to see it presented to those that were open to the gospel and those who were hostile to the gospel. In every situation we find ourselves in, there's a model for us in the book of Acts. What this is telling us in a very direct way is that God expects us to be his witnesses. He expects us to pick up on the example that was set in the early church and to take the gospel to our world. You know, being a witness for Jesus Christ is not optional for the Christian. It comes with the territory. The Great Commission is not a suggestion. It is a command. command. You, know, you, you remember the Great Commission, don't you? From Jesus? We are to go into all the world and make disciples of all men. But that's the calling on you as a child of God. That's the mission of our church. Now, there are two requirements if we're going to be witnesses for him. The first is that we need to be proclaimers of the gospel. That means there has to be a commitment in our lives to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And again, what we see in the book of Acts is not only a modeling of the gospel, but we actually see a proclamation of the gospel. The saints in the book of Acts actually told people about Jesus and then led them to Christ. And folks, I'm telling you that there is nothing more exciting than leading someone into the kingdom of God. There is nothing more fulfilling than being used of God to bring someone to Christ. Plus, it puts you in the most interesting situations. <laughs> I, I was talking to one of our gals. She was going on a mission trip with us, and, and uh, she was out rollerblading, and she was thinking about her testimony and how she would be giving it, and she went by a a homeless gal that she's seen many times and talked to her a few times. And she said, you know what? I, I think I'm going to tell this homeless gal about Jesus. So she whips up to her on her inline skates and says, hey, has anyone ever told you about Jesus? And this gal said, well, yeah, people tell me about Jesus all the time. And our gal was like, whoa, wow. Well, maybe it's someone from the church. So who's been telling you about Jesus? She said, well, mostly the Martians but also the communist. <laughs> she thought, well, maybe I should just keep skating and just pray for this gal. But, you know, most of the time, it's, it's more fruitful than that. J just this last week, Jay Carty called me up. You guys remember Jay Carty? And Jay told me about leading the person to Christ, a, a cancer patient, 
right in the, the waiting room of a doctor's office. One of our life group people told me a couple of backs about how they got in a conversation with a neighbor and end up leading their neighbor to Christ. Folks, that, that's so exciting. It's so great. But they had to open their mouths and tell them about Jesus. So the first requirement of being a witness for Jesus is the desire to tell others about Jesus and what he's done for us. The second requirement is that we have a lifestyle that matches our witness. You know, one of the things we're going to find out about the early church was that they, they had a high expectation for holy living. And when, when people get saved in the book of Acts, I mean, they get saved. They repent. They go through these amazing changes of lifestyle. The end result was that their lives matched the message. And that made them powerful witnesses for Jesus Christ. You know, one of the problems we have in the church today is oftentimes our lifestyle makes a mockery of our message. We talk to people about the power of God to change us and make us new creations in Christ, and yet we're living our lives in open sin. We're addicted to the same things they're addicted to. We're living the same sinful lifestyles that they are. We watch the same movies. We listen to the same music. There's no difference. And because of that, there's no witness. Well, that was not so in the early church. You might remember the account of Ananias and Sapphira. You find that in Acts chapter 5. Basically, their, their sin was that they, they lied to the Holy Spirit. See, people in the church were selling all they had and giving the money to the church and they sold all they had, but they only gave a portion. No, that wasn't the sin. The sin was that they sold all they had and they kept some back and they said they gave it all because they wanted to look good to the people. And you know what happened to them? They both died on the spot. And it says that great fear came upon the church and all who heard of these things. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, can you, can you imagine People walk into here and they're in sexual sin or people that were stealing from their work or people that were will, willfully using drugs and they, they walk into church and they, they just die? I mean, there'd be great fear in this place as well. But I'll tell you what would also be happening along with that. People would be getting saved. If you're to read down below the story of Ananias and Sapphira, what you find is that believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes, it says, of both men and women. You see, this is what happens when you have a church whose lifestyle matches its message. So to be a good witness, first we have to be committed to telling others about Jesus, actually telling them about Christ, and then you have to be committed to a lifestyle that matches your message. We're going to learn a lot more about that as we go through the book of Acts. Now, let's talk for a minute about the author of the book of Acts, and that, of course, is Luke. Luke was a co-worker of Paul. He first wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then as a companion to that, he wrote the book of Acts. Now, we know from Paul's letters to the Colossians that Luke was a doctor by profession, but he'd given up his practice to accompany Paul on his missionary journeys. So much of the book of Acts came from Luke's eyewitness account. He saw these things we're going to read about. He saw them with his own eyes. That gives us an interesting perspective. Luke was not a Jew. Luke was a Gentile, probably a Greek from Macedonia. This would account, account in part for Paul's vision to preach the gospel in Greece. Luke was obviously a very learned man. His knowledge of Greek literature, language, very apparent in his writings. There's no doubt he has a passion for the ministry. No doubt he has a passion for seeing people come to Christ. Another interesting note about the life of Luke is that we know he was the only person that stuck with the Apostle Paul to the end. He was there when Paul died. As Paul wrote his last letter to Timothy from the jail cell in Rome, Paul said, there is none with me but Luke. Everyone else had bailed from Paul. They'd all left him. But Luke stayed to the end. We know from this that Luke was a very faithful man. Now, both Luke's gospel and the book of Acts were addressed to the same person. You know who it is? Theophilus. In Luke's gospel, he's referred to as the most excellent Theophilus. That was a name given to a dignitary. 
And listen to the statement that Luke makes to him in the beginning of Luke's gospel. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of the things in which you were instructed. Now you can tell from the first couple verses that Luke was writing with the expressed purpose of solidifying the teaching that Theophilus had already received. Now, we don't know if Theophilus was a believer at the point he received Luke's gospel or not. But we do know that by the book of Acts, that he's no longer addressed as a dignitary, but as a brother. So we know that Luke's gospel had a tremendous impact on his life. Now, there's been much effort to discover who this guy was. And you'd think, for anyone who had two books in the New Testament addressed him, it'd be easy to figure out who he was. But no one can find him. We don't know much about him at all. Now, what's interesting is that Theophilus means lover of God. And some people believe that Theophilus wasn't a specific person, but a code name for all believers. If that's so, then we can read this book today as a personal letter written with us in mind. Others have said that Theophilus had hired Luke to write both the gospel and the book of Acts to help Paul in his defense against his Roman court case, the Roman government. That this book would have been part of the evidence that Paul presented, and that could be true. It's a fairly common thing for wealthy people to fund the research that was needed for defense in a court case. So Theophilus could have been killing two birds with one stone. Paul gets good resources for his defense. Theophilus gets additional information to go along with the solid teaching he'd already received. There's one thing we know for sure about all this. And that is that both Luke's gospel and the book of Acts were circulated together extensively among the early church. And in most cases, if one church had seen one, they'd had both these letters. They'd seen them both. That would have given these churches a pretty firm foundation to stand on. They would have been able to read the account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And then they would have seen how that ministry played out in the lives of the people that he touched. And if they would have had any knowledge of the Old Testament at all, it would have become obvious to them that the miracle-working God of the Old Testament was still at work in their world today. Just as God was doing the miraculous things back then to bring salvation to the world, God was doing miraculous things to bring salvation to their world. And here's what's great. That miracle-working God is still at work bringing salvation to a dead and dying world. And in that regard, the book of Acts is still being written. In fact, it's being written about the church on Maui. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's being written about our little church up here in Kapalua. And many of you are going to be noted in that story. What's happening in our church today is merely an extension of what happened in the book of Acts. The only difference is the names and the places have changed. And one of the things I find so sad about the church today is that there seems to be this thinking that what God did in the book of Acts will never be and should never be repeated again. But I ask you, is our world any different than it was back then? Is there less of a need for salvation today than there was back then? The answer is no. There's more of a need for evangelism today. Is God any different today than he was back then? No. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. Forever. What he did then, he wants to do today. Has the need of people changed? Oh, no. No, God still at work. The only thing that's stopping him now is 
It's us. Just like those first disciples, we've got to grab that vision of taking the gospel to our world. We've got to do that as well. Just as those first disciples had to be baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit, oh, so do we. Just as those first disciples had to allow themselves to be vessels that the power of God could flow through, so do we. And if we will, God will do things that will blow our minds. It might even be said of us. These are those who have turned their world right side up for the gospel. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this about the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the most lyrical of books. Live in that book. I exhort you. It is a tonic, the greatest tonic I know in the realm of the Spirit. That's what we're going to be doing for the next few months. We're going to be living in this book. We're going to be soaking in the tonic of the book of Acts. And folks, it's going to be exciting. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for where you're taking us as a church. And Lord, I I thank you for the the clear intent of the book of Acts is to tell us not so much what the disciples believed, just to tell us what the disciples, what the apostles, what the early church actually did. Lord, it shows us the power behind the early church, the risen Christ, flowing in our lives by his very spirit. And Lord, I I just pray over our church. I pray as we watch the Holy Spirit work through the early church that we'd have that longing, we'd have that desire to have the Holy Spirit move through us. Father, I, I know that there are some in our church, they don't even understand the Holy Spirit, his role in our lives. Oh, Jesus, make that clear to us. And then God, would you just imprint upon our hearts the mission of our church to take the gospel to our world. And Lord, we don't know much about the rest of the world, but we know about Maui, and Maui needs the gospel. Oh, how it needs the gospel. And Lord, I believe no one can put it out like we can. Just the unique way we can share your word with our world around us. So Father, we're going to soak in this book. This is going to be a tonic that we're going to live in. And Lord, I pray that you do things in our lives that would absolutely blow our minds. And Lord, this morning, there, there may be some here, and they, they remember a time in their life where they, they really function in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They remember days in their life when they, they just had a passion to tell people about Jesus. And somehow that's just kind of slipped away. Father, I'm I'm asking for a revival in our church. (laughs) I'm asking for a revival. I'm asking for a revival in me. Holy Spirit, what you did yesterday, that was for yesterday. But there's a new work that you want to do now. And it will be unique to our church. So unique for our church. So, Father, I I pray your spirit would just work in excitement into our lives. Excitement for what you desire to do and how you're going to use our church in the future. And, Lord, I will thank you for that. In Jesus' name.